Okay, we're gonna start again. Um, hello again, welcome back. Welcome to everybody who's joining us new. Welcome to everybody who's on YouTube. I'm just gonna quickly repeat that please keep your uh, videos muted and off. And if you have questions, post them in the chat here, or we're also monitoring the chat on Facebook and on YouTube. So if you ask questions there, we will see them. And uh, right now I'm going to ask for three people to come join me on the video screen um, to talk about how the breakout sessions went to report for everybody else um, and learn what they missed in the other breakout sessions. We're going to go um, uh, one, two, three in the order of the breakout sessions were numbered, but maybe all three people want to already join me in turning on their videos. And here's Julia, she'll be um, reporting from IIP. Alexandra is also here reporting for Shining. And I think Antonina for iScan is still missing. Antonina, would you turn on your video and join me? Hello. OK, great. Well, I'm actually going to hand over right to you, Antonina. And maybe you can give us in three to four minutes what you talked about and in your breakout sessions for the everybody else to hear. All right, so our breakout session focused on the tools used for the conflict analysis and namely it was divided into four different stages. Uh, the first one was the situation analysis or the so-called current issues with regards to the women and discernment. Second one is the causal analysis or the underlying causes that potentially lead to such current issues. Third one, uh, the actors involved in the conflict as well as we finished with a short discussion on suggestions for policy implementation and intervention strategies. So the current issues that were highlighted during our breakout session were Firstly, that there is a focus on spending on weapons rather than disarmament. Then there is a disagreement that some actors are promoting disarmament, such as civil society, whereas other actors, for example, some states' ministries of defense do not promote that. Uh, lack of dialogue between weapon and non-weapon states and the lack of understanding to come on the same page, as well as the, disarm uh, as well as the fact that disarmament is used as cash for guns initiative, where the rebels surrender guns for money and other economic means. Now, the underlying causes that been discussed during the breakout session were clan fights, uh, which as a colleague from Philippines uh, explained that there are a lot of family conflicts that influence the uh, dynamics of disarmament. Uh, for example, mafia-like structures and the power struggle. Then there is uh, a point on clashing international laws with regards to self-determination of a nation versus territorial integration that was mentioned with regards to the current uh, situation in Armenia. Then the other factor that was mentioned, the poverty and social and political exclusion, as well as access and fight for natural resources and ethnic cleanses. And of course, the ideologies and cultural and historical dynamics uh, as a cause for the conflict and the uh, contradict and, and the causes for that prevent disarmament from happening. And as men, uh, it was highlighted that as men are the ones that are mostly engaged in the battlefields, it uh, often leads to social uh, structure disruptions. And with regards to the actors, uh, we, there are obviously many sides to that. There is civil society, NGOs and IOs, the government, armed forces and the police. There are terrorist groups. And what was mentioned that also the third party interventions in the conflict are important to keep in mind because uh, neighboring countries that often do not necessarily know the underlying causes of a conflict that we mentioned in the previous part, such as the historical dynamics or the ideology or like, you know, the long, longer term history that is, you know, uh, can lead to the uh, conflict. 
uh, is very important to keep in mind, as well as a uh, colleague, uh, <laughs> Juliet Zimmerman, from, uh, uh, from your, <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous, from your NGO has mentioned that anyone can be a bad guy, depending on the perspective that the actors do take in the conflict. So um, in the interest of time, I'm going to jump to the... <laughs> policy suggestions and the main uh, suggestions as always were that due to the fact that there is a lack of women engagement in the peacekeeping uh, missions and disarmament processes, especially in the higher positions, there is an urgent need to bring more women to an, on the negotiation table and perhaps even adapt a gender lens on the disarmament processes with regard to policy implementation and increase uh, male advocacy for engagement of women in the disarmament processes. It is, of course, a very complex issue and um, it is not as easy to do. And it was mentioned that perhaps monitoring mechanisms and holding state member states accountable uh, and perhaps even you know implementing the quotas for the gender equality if necessary to reach a certain number of women participating in those processes is needed and it is hard to do of course due to the fact that international laws that, like not on uh, not always can be so easily implemented uh, due to the fact that the policy coherence depends highly on the local context. Uh, and we was proposed, the last suggestion proposed that consulting a wide range of actors from the very beginning stage of the dialogue up to the policy uh, making uh, would help to ensure that all perspectives are covered and that was kind of our wrap. I'm sorry that if I took longer, please back to you. Thank you Antonina, that sounded very interesting. I hope uh, people got to take away a lot from it. I'm now gonna hand over to Julia. Julia joined the breakout session two on women in nuclear, which was with the International Institute for Peace. Please, Julia. Hello, everybody, and thanks, Antonina, for reporting back from breakout sessions, uh, session one. Uh, you did this in a very structured way, and I have to say beforehand that our discussion was not that structured. But I think so. We didn't uh, um, elaborate policy recommendations, but I think we could subscribe to the policy recommendation of more women on the negotiation table. So we were a group of very diverse backgrounds, and it uh, was a very instructive discussion. So it's going to be a little bit difficult to wrap it up all in a few minutes. But we had the pleasure to have Nadia Schmidt from ICANN on our breakout session, who we're going to hear afterwards in the evening panel. And our breakout session started off by emphasizing what was said by Laura Rockwood in her keynote, that full and especially meaningful participation in security matters is very important. So there have, have to be women and marginalized groups on the table and also um, it's very important on the meaningful par participation. So it's not just numbers, but also content. Uh, yeah. So then we started by talking a little bit about the history of the Treaty on Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, in short, the TPNW, and the committee who was uh, in charge of establishing this treaty, the uh, Humanitarian Initiative. And um, Nadia instructed us that it, this committee was a very inclusive one. So um, uh, in concerning, uh, concerning female participation and participation by marginalized groups, but also very important participation of states who are normally not on the table when it comes to nuclear negotiations, such as small countries, uh, non-nuclear countries um, and island states or anything like this. And secondly, also very important, the voice of victims of nuclear attacks or nuclear testing was heard. So this framework is a very comprehensive one. Um, and unfortunately, it has not entered into force yet, but um, we're about to get there. So yeah. 
the downside of the uh, NPW, uh, NPNW is that no nuclear state was on the table. And what's also very important that in this whole negotiations also um, states which are in official nuclear states should be included such as Israel, Pakistan, North Korea. Additionally, we then uh, came a little bit on to the feminist approach and uh, the problem with nuclear weapons is the same as in uh, all general sec security um, matters. So strength, um, nuclear weapons is attributed to masculinity, to male actors, and the victims are the weak and the weak ones are always women. So we then also found out that many aspects of non-traditional security on which we also try to focus with why, so like physical security or um, having, having access to education is often covered under the umbrella of development and therefore is attributed to women or the female side. Um, yeah, then we talked about effect or uh, Nadia to uh, told, uh, told us effect that was very interesting for me. So sometimes, people like um, Foreign Minister of Germany Maas um, or Federica Mogherini, before they um, took their very important official positions, they were in a movement for the abolition of nuclear weapons. But then when they took up this very official um, uh, positions, they somehow stepped back and didn't talk about this anymore. So I think this power could be used in the very in this discourse. And yeah, um, yeah. Then we talked a little bit about uh, treaty negotiations and, for example, the NPT, the CTPT, the New Start, and the PNW treaty. And I think I can conclude that all of those are in a not very good position at the moment, in a very insecure one, with uh, multilateralism being not in a good state at the moment. Um, yeah, this was, no, we then touched upon COVID too. And many of us thought it would be very interesting to have a study on the correlation of COVID and defense uh, spending. So if anybody has any information or wants to do research in this field, please share information. And I think one good takeaway from our session was that we need to demasculinize militarization and to demilitarize security so that uh, women and uh, marginalized groups can be on the table and do have a valid say in the whole uh, discourse. Thanks, back to you, Jesse. Thanks, Julia. That was super comprehensive and sounded really interesting. I'm really glad that we get to hear Nadia speak on the panel later too. Um, uh, I'm going to hand over to Alexandre, who was in the third breakout session on um, humanitarian disarmament, which I also got to join. I really like, but I'm going to hand over to her. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so as Jessica said, I was in the last group on disarmament as humanitarian action. And we first began by talking about intersectionality in disarmament and the different ways disarmament is viewed globally um, and how issues can come together. We then talked about how gender needs to be part of the solution and how women's voices in disarmament will lead to further solutions and further views that are perhaps not very present today. I think one of our main takeaways on this was that disarmament actually can be the solution and kind of the come between or the P as we put it in our group um, between disarmament um, and humanitarian action. Um, because often we talked a lot about how civil society groups have a very different view on disarmament from the military that are present in the same areas. Um, in that regard, we talked about the differences on views of positive and negative peace and how military are very much taught just a negative peace standpoint, which doesn't lend itself to disarmament for um, more of a positive peace standpoint by humanitarian action groups afterwards. Um, and this way, we had a lot of different anecdotes and we talked about 
Mali and how um, groups there, ethnic groups there were forced to arm themselves and take up arms themselves rather than being helped by the military because they didn't have enough power and how that actually lended itself to greater overall issues rather than being part of the solution. Um, in this, we talked a lot about how education is really essential to bringing together military and civil society actors so that humanitarian action and disarmament within those regions can occur. Um, we did also then touched on the strengths and weaknesses of disarmament and how different organizations see disarmament. For example, the military sees disarmament as not always a positive thing and how other groups often see disarmament as the only solution and kind of bringing it about um, how the precedent of disarmament can affect our future of disarmament. So what are the older um, ideas of disarmament and what needs to be the present ideas of disarmament? Um, I think in this, we also came up with an education and looking at precedent. Um, I think this conversation was really interesting and we talked about a lot of different subjects um, and kind of straight away from disarmament as the main one, it really brought in a lot of humanitarian action. So I think overall our main takeaways were that education is essential for bringing both together military and civilian um, sectors on disarmament in general. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you especially to um, Julia, Antonina and Alexandria who um, uh, volunteered to present what was happening in the breakout sessions. We're gonna move along in our program now and head to our second set of uh, lightning talks for which I would like to now ask Suzanne and Emma, if possible, <laughs> to turn on their videos. I say Emma, if possible, because she is here. However, um, she's joining from Somaliland and her internet connection is not quite stable for video. But uh, nevertheless, Susanne, if you would like to turn on your video. And we'll head straight into your lightning talk. And um, Susanne is here today to talk about a uh, gender sensitive arms trade in the Netherlands. Susanne recently obtained her master's of science in political science at Leiden University with a focus on gender peace and security. Uh, in cooperation with Women, the Dutch Center platform, she has investigated Dutch commitment to the arms trade treaty, which we heard a little bit about just now by, from Julia, and especially article 7.4. Um, currently, Sun is working at the Secret CAG E66 team, where she is responsible for the youth campaign strategy. And we're really happy to have her here today. Thank you, Jessica, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Yeah, my name is Suzanne Gilbervein, and today I would like to talk about uh, the research that I've done in cooperation with Women Equals Men. Uh, the Dutch gender platform in the Netherlands. Uh, yeah, and I've done research on gender sensitive arms exports. So to uncover the Dutch compliance to the arms trade treaty. Um, so why do I want to talk about the arms trade treaty, specifically Article 7.4, and what makes it so interesting for the gender peace security agenda? Um, first, to get everyone up to speed, uh, the objective of the arms trade treaty is to establish a common international standard for the regulation of international tra uh, trade in conventional arms. Um, it aims to prevent and eradicate illicit trade uh, in conventional arms and prevent their diversion. So the purpose of this treaty is to uh, contribute to international peace, security and stability and to reduce human suffering and to promote cooperation. So with, with, each, uh, with this treaty, each state party to the treaty shall establish and maintain a national control system uh, to regulate arms exports. So this means that every state that is exporting arms needs to assess uh, the arms export, whether it's gonna be um, used to, to, for, yeah, for human suffering or not, like it's an assessment. So now I will zoom into Article 7.4 of this treaty. Um, this is actually a very important article for the gender peace security agenda because for a long time gender was not really treated as a security issue. 
So uh, in 2014, after more than 10 years of uh, lobbying by gender organizations, gender was added to the arms trade treaty uh, of the UN. So this means that all state parties to the treaty have to implement a national control system in which they assess, amongst other things, the risk of gender-based violence when exporting arms. So um, this can mean like, is the end user going to use these arms for gender-based violence? This is very short set, but basically it's what it comes down to. Um, so with this, the UN has linked the prevention of gender-based violence to the transfer, proliferation, and use of weapons. Um, you may ask, why? <laughs> why would you link those two together? Well, the use of weapons has an immediate and disproportionate effect on the social and political freedom of women compared to men. And weapons increase the risk of gender-based violence in conflict areas. Um, marginalized groups who often already face discrimination become increasingly targeted during armed conflicts. Um, the loss of infrastructure, housing, family, and increasing chaos leads to more vulnerability and the likelihood of uh, sexual exploitation. Um, a quote that I found really interesting from senior UN relief um, official Kyung Wa Kang said, simply crisis exacerbates gender inequalities. So um, as weapons keep entering the country, uh, groups are enabled to sustain the conflict, which allows for continued forms of uh, violence, such as rape, uh, forced marriage, domestic violence, displacement, and lack of appropriate medical care. Um, this, uh, this research has been focused on Article 7.4 of the treaty, which notes that an arms exporting state, when making an arms assessment, takes into account the risk of conventional arms, ammunition, munition, parts and components being used to commit or facilitate gender-based violence or serious acts of violence against women and children. So a national control system has to be implemented, which assesses whether an arms shipment is being used uh, in the destination to commit or facilitate gender-based violence. Um, so me and the people at Women Equals Men Dutch Gender Platform wondered how gender sensitive arms expert assessments look like uh, and if the implementation of this specific uh, assessment has an impact on arms exports. So my research goal was to understand the relation between the securitization of gender in the arms trade treaty and arms expert policies. So Having done extensive research on the case of the Netherlands, me and the people of um, Women Equals Men Dutch Gender Platform wondered whether there is a discrepancy between the commitment uh, of the Netherlands and the practices. Um, so the Netherlands is quite an interesting case, I think, because it's internationally known for its commitment to human rights. Um, it's being part of different human rights treaties, etc. and when the arms trade treaty came into force, um, the Netherlands was actually became state party that same year. Uh, but at the same time, um, the Netherlands has been high on the list of largest military exporters uh, in the past 10 years, and it has been shipping arms to known human rights violators. Um, so uh, that's, yeah, that's why I think the Netherlands is such an interesting case because it has these two kind of, um, I say, yeah, concepts that are pretty far away from each other. So um, in the study, I've used the different theoretical mechanisms uh, of compliance to understand this relationship between gender securitization and arms export policies. Um, yeah, different theoretical mechanisms I've tested, such as cost benefit analysis, reputation and shaming, domestic capacity and international cooperation. And these are four mechanisms that could potentially explain uh, compliance or non-compliance to an international treaty. Um, so basically, how does it work in the Netherlands? Um, arms expert control in the Netherlands is organized in two different clusters. 
basically um, all license requests are filed with the central department import experts so if someone or a state wants to buy arms from the netherlands they file for um, a license this license like the request is being assessed um, so the central department import experts um, makes two groups um, basically all the requests from non-allied countries non-EU countries, uh, non-NATO countries and or risk marked countries are forwarded to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So they deal with more risky type of arms requests. Um, so at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we have a cluster called the Arms Expert Control Cluster and they assess the more risk, yeah, risk marked uh, requests. And the CDIU, the Central Department Import Experts, um, is responsible for the assessment of license requests from NATO countries and EU member states, so more allied countries. Um, both of these departments then perform an assessment that will define whether the experts uh, of the arms requested is legitimate. So they do background checks, they assess who's going to use the weapons, are they going to be used to harm humans, <laughs> basically. It's a very long process. Uh, so they make an assessment. Uh, from, from my interview, um, I've interviewed representatives from both clusters and also uh, civil society representation on the topic of arms expert control. I further relied on documents and general transcripts, debate transcripts. Um, so we want to understand the relation between Article 7.4 and Dutch expert assessments. So how does Article 7.4 work in practice? Um, so basically, actually, the Netherlands assesses uh, expert licenses on the basis of eight criteria. These criteria are agreed upon in the EU. Uh, it's called the EU Composition on Arms Experts. Um, so they have a checklist of eight criteria that an assessment needs to um, uphold in order for the, for the arms to be shipped. So basically criteria two of the EU composition states that each member state shall assess an expert license application based on respect uh, for human rights in the country of the final destination, as well as respect of international humanitarian law. So in the day-to-day -day practice, the arms trade treaty is not used. It is used because, uh, because the EU composition is already defined, they already defined practices surrounding arms expert control assessments. Um, but uh, formally in 2019, Article 7.4, which indicates gender-based violence assessments, has been added to the EU composition formally in 2019, informally already since 2014. So um, the Netherlands doesn't use uh, the experts, the arms trade treaty, However, it is incorporated within the EU position. I see that my time might be up. I'm not sure. No. Um, so what have I found? Basically, a general issue with international human rights uh, treaties is that there is no legal enforcement mechanism. Um, this is an issue. The, the arms trade treaty would have not come into force if an enforcement mechanism was on the table. Um, and the EU composition does not have an enforcement mechanism because it is part of security, which is arranged under national competence. So, um, yeah, that's very important to understand as well. Um, so my main takeaway, my main takeaway basically is that um, the lack of domestic capacity has the largest effect on Dutch compliance to Article 7.4. So what we see on a day-to-day -day basis in the arms assessment in the Netherlands is that um, the cluster is aware of the risk uh, under uh, the risk assessment under Article 7.4. However, it has made administrative decisions to place it under a larger human rights assessment. Um, there's a lack of capacity, there's not enough people, there's not enough resources to create a full assessment that's focused on gender-based violence uh, in accordance to Article 7.4. Um, yeah, 
So basically what it comes down to is that it's a domestic capacity type of issue. Uh, so what I found is that the assessment that is being made is a general human rights assessment. Uh, so concluding, yeah, the implication is that there's a discrepancy between the understanding of gendered aspects of conflict and administrative practices. So again, conflict is approached as a homogenous occurrence where victims are considered all the same. The reality is though that during conflict, women are often the first group to lose their fundamental rights. And there are many organizations that are aware of the consequences of unregulated arms trades and uh, on the consequence on women. And they've pushed to get uh, this reality acknowledged in mainstream security, in this mainstream security treaty. However, we see in practice that, yeah, this is all still under the concept of human rights rather than a gendered yeah, understanding of human rights. So basically that's it. Very short, <laughs> skimmed over, but uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was really interesting. You really got to wonder that if countries like the Netherlands don't have the capacity, what it looks like in other countries. Um, but yeah, with that, uh, we're going to switch to another continent. And um, Emma, if, would you like to at least say hello for a moment? <laughs> switch in. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, my internet is not good enough for the video, but I will be on the chat if anyone has any question and I am here. So thank you very much for including me today. Yeah, like I mentioned, um, Emma is in Somaliland. She uh, is currently working as a research officer in conflict in Hargeisa, Somaliland for Consilient. She's a graduate of the uh, Central European Uni University, which is newly moved to Vienna. So if anybody's there from the Central, here from the Central uh, European University, welcome to Vienna. And um, her thesis there focused on the demobilization, disarmament and reincorporation re of former FARC combatants. And that is here, um, and that is what we're gonna hear about now. So if you give me one moment, I'm going to share my screen and start her video. And if you uh, aren't able to watch it, we're also gonna post the YouTube link and you can watch it there. Good afternoon, my name is Emma Bionpudek and I am here today to present my research on demobilization, disarmament and reintegration in Colombia. As most of you already know, Colombia was crippled by a civil war for 52 years. This conflict was the longest in the Western Hemisphere. It led to the death of over 200,000 people and displaced millions. In 2016, the Colombian President Santos signed a historical and landmark peace agreement with the FARC in Havana, Cuba. This agreement was rejected in a referendum later on by the population. It was modified and passed through parliament that same year. Its implementation began in January 2017 after more than 50 years of civil war. Now in its third year, the implementation is slow, uneven, and is encountering several difficulties. In August 2019, some ex FARC leaders called for the return to an armed insurgency against the government, citing the failures of the Colombian government in implementing the peace agreement. I was in Colombia during that summer of 2019. I was doing a peace building training in Cali, and I was confronted to a much less optimistic picture of the peace agreement than I thought I would find on the ground. This prompted many questions, including what is explaining the gap between theory and practice in this peace agreement, and especially DDR. While doing my master, I decided to research this topic further and find explanations to the shortcomings of the implementation of DDR in Colombia. I found that several factors had deeply impacted the chances of success of DDR in Colombia, and more particularly, the reincorporation phase. The first finding is that the transition between phases of DDR is critical. In the first two phases, the process is more straightforward, 
technical and it requires the, invo the involvement of less actors, three in this case. Whereas reintegration is a long-term process which encompasses social, historical, cultural, and economic considerations. It requires more individual considerations and considerable resources. It is widely agreed that the reintegration phase of DDR is the most challenging. In Colombia, the mobilization and disarmament were very successful phases where the FARC, the UN, and the Colombian government collaborated successfully. However, the planning of the reintegration phase was rushed during the negotiations of the peace agreement in 2016 because of the end of President Santos' term. The phase remained underprepared until the beginning of implementation. At the start of the reincorporation period, there were significant disagreements within the National Reincorporation Council as to whether the reintegration should be individual or collective, which is why I'm referring to reincorporation. This disagreement lasted a year and translated into a lack of strategy that integrates the need of former combatants. This caused significant delays and hampered trust within parties as former combatants had disarmed for months and still could not access the benefits that should be given to them. To this day, only a quarter of former combatants benefited from financial support towards their economic project. There are early warnings that this could lead many former combatants to retake arms, whether with FARC dissidents or other armed groups, but these warnings were not sufficiently addressed in programming. These shortcomings empowered FARC dissidents who called others to take up arms again in August 2019. It is fair to say that this lack of preparation and strategy specifically affects women. A specific example gathered from an interview indicated the construction of a daycare facility within a reincorporation camp. However, these daycares did not have staff, which meant that the women could not leave their children in those buildings and still had to care for them during the day and not be able to attend to their role within the reintegration process. If these flows extend to many reintegration camps in the country, it leads to a several limitation of women's participation in DDR, which represent a significant security risk in the long term. The role of women is guaranteed in the peace process, which was held as one of the most progressive in the world in terms of gender provision, but its implementation is lacking. There is, for example, a lack of women representative in key reincorporation institutions. It is important to remember that more of a third of FARC members were women, and they judged the organization as considering gender equality more than the society as a whole. A failure to include women in DDR results in long-term security risk and the potential to disfranchise women from the agreement. Another key finding from my research was the reintegration versus reincorporation strategy. The FARC opted for collective reincorporation in Colombia, while the experience the country had, as well as its institution, were with individual reintegration processes. This made the case of the FARC rather unique in the world in terms of reincorporation, but the group wanted to support their ideology and reject the individual neoliberal blueprint of an individual reintegration. The FARC picked remote rural areas where they used to have control for them to become reincorporation camps. This would also make it easier for them to escape and remain safe in case the agreement failed. This decision to me testified of the lack of trust between parties and the risk former combatants took while disarming. However, this implied that FARC former combatants would want to remain together instead of going back to their families or cities for better opportunities, which failed to materialize as many former combatants wanted to rejoin their families. These remote areas also meant people would be away from basic infrastructure and services. This led to an exodus of former combatants from the remote reincorporation camps, which makes it hard for them to be provided with not only reincorporation services, but protection. By protecting their political collective agenda, 
FARC underestimated several factors which today translate into a, major, into a major security issue for former combatants. Since 2017, more than 200 former combatants have been murdered, 2020 being the worst years in terms of former combatants killed. Social leaders supporting the peace process are also very targeted. The whole approach of FARC was based on the ideology of a guerrilla and not according to realistic economic assessment, which represented a significant obstacle for its implementation. The choice of, rural, of remote rural areas also led to the problem of land, as the former combatants mainly had rural agricultural projects, but no land was available for them. The ring cooperation process never had a strategy for former combatants to access the land they needed. In 2020, still no plot of land was allocated. Land has always been a cause for conflict in Colombia and no land reforms happened since colonization. This worrying fact is only reinforced by the fact that only half of the land in the country is actually registered. This significant limitation leaves half of the country's territory up for grab susceptible to violence and illicit activities, which creates a significant security vacuum for armed groups to compete over. The current government is in the process of establishing land registries. However, it is very important to stress the importance of land reforms to achieve lasting peace in Colombia, not only reincorporation. As long as the issue of land is not addressed, not only would it greatly affect the chances of reincorporation, but it would embolden armed groups and fuel violence and displacement. To conclude, I would like to reiterate the importance of the transition between the phases of the ER. I would like to emphasize as well the choice of collective reincorporation as critical and explaining a lot of the shortcomings we're seeing today in Colombia. Finally, to avoid more political instability at the national level, it is essential to analyze the role of the land in this conflict and in reincorporation of former combatants. Just 20% of FARC dissidents would still form the biggest guerrilla in the country. The peace process, and more particularly the reincorporation phase, is at a critical point, and it's important now more than ever to follow its implementation, to support organizations implementing the provisions, and to lobby for full implementation of the peace agreement. Thank you for your attention, and I'm now looking forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, so that was Emma's talk. And Emma's talk basically uh, concluded the first part of our conference. Um, I took a lot away from it. I thought it was very, very interesting. My head is buzzing with all the new ideas I've gathered. I think all that remains for me to be said right now is, first of all, um, as I said in the beginning, this conference has very much been about also realizing what wise Austria is all about. If um, you like this, if you like the concept of hearing um, female security experts speak about their um, expertise, uh, bringing together um, especially young people who are interested in the topic, we'd really like to encourage you to become a wise member and you can sign up on our website. At the moment, of course, it is a little bit difficult uh, under the circumstances to host regular meetings, but we are trying our best. And we'll probably have another event before Christmas or in this year, let's say, um, probably online. Um, but yeah, so we'd really like to have you in our group. Both men and women are welcome and all genders really. Um, yeah, at this point, maybe um, if you are interested in connecting to the other people around you, we would like to invite you to also post your own LinkedIn or Twitter accounts into the chat for other people to follow. And please don't forget that even though the formal part of the conference is now over, the panel will continue in the evening. It is uh, open for everybody. You can access it through the same link that you've been using all day, and that is on your agenda. In your conference manual and 
yeah, thank you for, to everybody who joined, who made this um, conference possible. I think maybe at this point, we might even be able to all turn on our videos, see each other and uh, give the round of applause to everybody who spoke today and especially the WISE team around us. Uh, and we also wanted to take a picture if possible, if you like. So we can all have one big group picture of everybody who's here today. Thank you for being here and hello and goodbye to everybody. See you later for the panel.